you'll uh, enjoy this little bit of story. So, story time you, with Cormac. Yay! I don't know if you can <laughs> see the little cut on my nose. What bit you? Or did you fall? Here's what's funny. <laughs> Nothing. So this was okay. The other day, out shoveling snow. Uh-huh. It was somewhere around the neighborhood of uh, a wind chill of negative fifteen. So every bit of my extremities were completely frozen. So it's frostbite? No. So <laughs> okay. I was walking around a tree. Lynn was too short and limb brushed across Just, my, my nose. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the funny thing is I didn't know. There was no like blood dripping or anything like that. So then I come inside. Because it was frozen. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started to defrost. <laughs> and then I look down and I see drips of blood on my desk. And I'm like, what, what, what what's Whoa. going on? And I put <laughs> my yeah. hand and there's blood on my hand. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I go in and I look and I'm like, what? what? I was like, oh. Yeah, what happened? Yeah. That. I, oh, that. And it was just like, seriously? Like, it was so cold that I couldn't feel any of my extremities to alert me that, hey, dummy, you just sliced your nose. So check this real quick. Do you see this? What is that? Oh, is that where you live? No. So this is the original main building of Hopkins. Oh, okay. And here's our building peeking in the background. Oh, okay. Looming. Looming. It's looming in the background. <laughs> it's photobombing. That's what your building's doing. <laughs> it is. <laughs> your window is your your not your window. Your building is actually photobombing that classical piece of architecture. I know, right? Come on. <laughs> Trying to get it adjusted so I can kind of look up. Look up. Look up. Remember that AIA campaign? I look up. I look up. Does that still exist? Does that still happen? Do hashtags ever really go away? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think the internet remembers all. But I mean, like people still use them. Yeah. And only architects for some reason still use what an architect does and mm. what are the other ones? <laughs> it's because no one... Up. People still don't know what architects do. <laughs> you got to keep using it until, until the education is complete. What do architects do? What do architects <laughs> I'll tell you what they do. They fight their software. They spend way too much time doing stupid things to make uh, lines print on pages. They just waste your life doing that, doing that stuff. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> that's what architects do. That's I miss optimism. that. <laughs> <I, yeah. laughs> that, uh, sir, is optimism. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I was I was editing my other podcast today, and uh, my guest on that episode said something I thought was a great quote. And I, uh, so, so tell me what you think when when you hear this. It's 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 not about architecture. It's about the life afforded. And so it obviously implies that you have a life outside of it. It's not all about architecture. So, so interpret. Uh, architecture. It's not about architecture. Pursuit, it's about the life afforded. So is it the pursuit of and or the profession of architecture affords you a certain lifestyle? Is that, the, I, I, is I that think the it's indication? more of an ethos of, of how you apply yourself to architecture than it is about, like, it's not just like if you become an architect, you will have a good life. It's not saying that at all. Okay. <laughs> it's saying, it's saying something very different, which is more of an ethos or an approach to thinking about how you apply yourself to the profession. And, and there are, you, we just had this episode, Cormac, we just, yeah. we just had the, I apply uh, myself 100%, man. In more fact, than that. <laughs> in fact, 
I believe it's way more than that. Yeah. I believe billable time is like somewhere around 160, 170. Yeah. I'm not surprised. So how's that going? I'm, I'm here Honestly, to be your accountability partner for, do you, the, do you, for this do you, episode. Well, let's do a little catch up here and, and see how it's going so far. Honestly, it's actually, it's been going well. Probably much to the chagrin of the people who continuously keep messaging me in the evening, you know, let's just say well the after. times when you used to be able to be found at the computer. The times that I used to be able to be found. I... Somebody was just ringing me um, last evening, actually. Computer was still on. It seems like it takes forever to go to sleep. And I don't, like, just, you know, shut it down. I let it fall asleep. And, mm-hmm. and so I was downstairs, and somebody had then texted me. And they said, oh, I was just trying to call you through Zoom. Do you have a minute? I'm like, it's 8.30 at night. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't. Did you say that out I did. loud? Just no, to no, yourself no, or, no, or no, no, no. That was the, to them. That was the reply back to them. You know, I was like, nice, it's 8.30 at nice. night. Unfortunately, I don't. You know, <laughs> and they were like, oh, well, I guess it can wait till the morning. But oh, yes. You think? Yes, it can. <laughs> and my, my follow-up you response think? to them was, you should probably log off and go enjoy some life. Yeah. Right. Yeah, something like that. It's, yeah, I don't yeah. think it, it sounded a little bit harsher than how I said it. Right now. Yeah. yeah. So you said it nicer than that. I, I said it a lot nicer than that. It was, it didn't sound as harsh, but it was basically, it was just like, come on, man. I'm not demanding you be there. So please don't demand that on yourself to be there either. How you important know? do you think it is to actually hear that from somebody else? I, I kind of feel like it's really important. Otherwise, I've, your imagination will construct uh, an expectation that may not be reality. So, you know, we've, and, and I've told you, we've got some unrealistic deadlines for unrealistic expectations, unrealistic deadlines for this current project that I'm on. And okay, whatever. But you know, like I said, I've gotten to that point where it's time to detach. And I'm not, res- I'm responsible for being able to be as productive as I can in the allotted time that I have, right? Mm -hmm. And if that time isn't going to get everything done, do I continue to keep sacrificing everything, like my time, my time with my family, my time with, you know, just here on earth, do this, I, is, this gets back to my quote. This is the life afforded, yeah. right? Like, like you do the thing, you work, yeah. And the contract is to do the eight hours per day of work, and the other part of the day is completely yours. So you know these like little video shorts on Instagram. One of my favorite ones are, and I probably have said at least one or two of them to you before. Seems how like, you at least wake up to about eighteen of them from me. <laughs> <laughs> this is what this is what we do. This is we, what we, send, we do. We send these videos, these reels to each other. Yeah. And and so one of the reels was you know, this guy who he's just he puts on a European accent. And he's like, uh, people, this guy is sick, and so he'll be out. And they're like, oh no, and 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 so they basically are comparing and contrasting the way a a, a European employee and an American employee would react to that or it's like American a Scandinavian management. typically yeah. right it's a it's a Finn or a Swede yeah. right and <laughs> and he'll and then he'll get to the American and he'll do the American one it's just like you know uh hey boss I'm gonna be out for 15 minutes I'm having open heart surgery but I'll be sure to like make it up in the the <laughs> later on today right. and you're like is this this is the this is the expectation that we have and so I bring that Not up quite because, to that extreme, but but yes, well, I, know I bring this up is because I am trying to. So as I'm trying to reprogram myself, I'm trying to also reprogram the people that I work with, mm-hmm. because I'll have. Well, you were setting a really bad example. You said, "Yeah, I was. I was setting a bad example, <laughs> sure, but I think the profession sets the bad example." And so they were texting me, and they're like, "Hey." Uh, Whatever you need help today, uh, just let me know. I'm like, it's Saturday. And they're like, 
well, yeah, but, you know, we've, we've got this deadline. I understand that, but it's Saturday. And you have children and go spend time with them. Just have, don't, don't use work. I don't necessarily say want to use it as an excuse, but just because you have work doesn't mean you have to do work on your time, you know, on the time that you've earned, right? The time away from. It, yeah. It sounds crazy that we even have to say this stuff out loud. It, it sounds, it sounds absolutely, absolutely absurd. Yeah. I will say that, I, you know, did I go back to the computer a little bit last evening? Sure, because I was also, you know, I traded a little bit of time. I was out slicing my nose open, you know, <laughs> in frigid temperature while well, like, yeah, you scraping. Yeah, you have to do what you have to do. And so as I was out, like, doing some, you know, some personal work for an hour and a half. And so I'll give you that hour and a half back. You know, I don't. I don't shortchange anybody on the uh, on the hours that I owe them, but you know, I'm also like, it's eight thirty. Sorry, not not available. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so so back to my question: Do you think people need to hear that? Because I think there's... I think people do need to hear that over and over and over again. Mm, you know, you people. Go. So so let me ask you this: Because this this seems to be something that people fly this flag of pride. And it's just like, oh, I'm out there hustling. I'm up at four in the morning and I'm working till 10 at night. Like, I, the more I hear other people say, you know, they're out there hustling, they're making it happen and all this other stuff. The more that I hear that, the more I realize what I was doing to myself. And I look back at him like, why? Why? Well, okay, so let let me let me take a stab at that one because I think it could be interpreted in different ways. So uh, the idea of side hustle is kind of a weird term that I think a lot of people have an allergy to, especially in 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 architectural land that we live in, which is I mean, you you could you could describe it as moonlighting, you could describe it as a side hustle, but te- there's generally an allergy to working more right and so i think a lot of times when people say they're out there hustling we could interpret it as they're working more on something now yeah where i want to make the distinction here is is i don't think we should interpret it that way i think we should ask more questions because i think that there is an importance to a side hustle if it is bringing passion and inspiration back to what you are as an architect and so if you're making money doing it, okay. Sure. If you're not making money doing it, okay. It, like, like just call it what you call it what it is. But if it's a side hustle to you, then that probably means you're making money on it and it's important to you. But it's also invigorating you to do better. My, my hope would be that it is invigorating you to do better at, at your main thing. Right. And I think that leadership in firms that you are employed at should – they should appreciate that at some level because you are a prob. I would hope a better architect for it because right. the career so, of architecture and this thing are are separate things, but they inform each other. So I can agree with that, but when people take pride in, oh, I'm outworking you, like hold my beer. I've been outworking Is that everybody. What it means for, when they're hustling? Okay, but, so I, I, mean, I went the other way. I went with So but, but you're but <laughs> you are right, but the, the, there are people, friends of ours that uh, they will take pride in you know, their go-getter. their yeah. job, you know, they're a principal at a firm or something like that and they're out there, you know, bragging about how much time they spend doing work. Yeah. And there's some you weird know, competitive it, thing going on there in, like in they're, his, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is that enriching your life? Is that improving you as an architect? Mm-hmm. I mean, could be. Or is it just sure. that internal political competition that we find in corporate right. America? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean. Not just America even. You know, if if, if people want to like start comparing time cards, I mean, I, I'm ready. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> But that's not, you know. Please, please no. I don't want to yeah. be at that a lunch discussion. That exactly. sounds terrible. But I, <laughs> but I think that that's what has been the, the detriment to the profession is, 
because as we, you know, we talked about the whole, you know, it leading to burnout and things like that. You know, I agree with if you're talking about hustle as a way to enrich yourself in being a better architect, a better employee or a better employer, um, you know, experiencing things to to like really broaden your understanding, your horizons, all that other stuff. Okay, that I can get behind. I mean, I don't even want you to do it for those reasons. I just want you to have other experiences. Right, that, right, right, that, right, right. Sure. That's, that, that, that's uh, what I meant. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. That, that's however, however, it's improving your life, your way of life. How that, that part is great. And that part I can totally get behind. But when it's this very, in, in an, I would say that it seems like it's a very American thing, but it may not necessarily be just an American thing, as we've you know yeah. kind of talked about in the past. But this this need to outwork people, this need to you know, there's another series of reels that I've you know, been following, and it's this 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 guy who basically is just like he's acting out like real um, real situations in corporate America, and one the most recent one that I watched was employees and the staff gets pulled into the conference room for a 5 uh, p.m. Uh, meeting. And they're just like, raise your hand. You know, how many people do you believe that this is a nine to five job? You know, put your hand down. This is not a nine to five job. You know, we're, we're here to, he's like, I want you to live and breathe. You know, this, I want you to give all, give your all, give everything to this job. We, you know, we all want to succeed. We all want the company to grow and we can't grow as a nine to five job. You know, and I keep thinking to myself, why? Why can't you? You know, does it really demand that you wake up at 4 a.m. and go to bed at, you know, like log off from you know, your work day at 10 p.m.? You know, what what is that accomplishing? You know, is that accomplishing this, this, are you amassing wealth? Well, what are you doing with that wealth? Is it wealth? Is it, you know, like dollar wealth? Is it spiritual wealth? Is it? emotional wealth? I mean, is it family wealth? You know, I mean, like what if you're just doing it to build your capital wealth? Is that really, does that really measure the quality of life that you're living? So that, so back to that question your that value. you're, so back to that, you know, statement question, whatever it was that your, your guest on um, your podcast, your mm -hmm. moonlighting mm -hmm. podcast, your other hustle. <laughs> My side hustle. Your side hustle. <laughs> totally uh, is. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm at the point in my life where I, I do not have a main employer except for myself, right? And so, I don't know if we've really talked I about that on this yeah. podcast, but but this is, yeah, it is my side hustle. <laughs> I don't necessarily know if it's, it is just your hustle. It is your, you know, like it's all my hustle. It. Yeah. It, it's my work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're, but you're, it does, uh, it does enrich some of our conversations as I does. just, ex just, as I just, uh, you know, gave an example of by sharing that quote with yeah. the audience here and you. So, yeah. yeah. So, because so you were, you were going to say, so uh, back to the quote, I said, it's not about architecture. It's about the life afforded. Right. And in, in, I think that doing a, a, a really strong analysis of what you do and how it translates to Maybe in this particular case, it's like the life afforded. How are you living your life? I mean, what are you doing mm -hmm. with, okay, sure, you're an, you're an architect, you're earning a good salary, hopefully, or you're maybe, whatever. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. You know, <laughs> somebody asked me, um, real quick side diversion here, somebody asked me, it's like, you know, hey, are you uh, going to the Lions-Buccaneers playoff game? You know, so just a date, you How know. How much are those tickets? You know. <laughs> And, and so I have actually been paying attention to, I was just like, uh -huh. you know what I do for a living. And actually some, some of, you know, I have no idea how, what that actually means. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> well, the funny thing was that it was a person who I work with who has asking me that I was like, you know where I work, you know what I'm doing for yeah. a living? Like, <laughs> and, not rhetorical. and so they're like, well, what are some of the prices of the tickets? I'm like, well, you know, I started seeing things at like 1100. And now that minimum yeah. price just keeps getting ratcheted up, ratcheted up, and the closer yeah. and closer you wait, it gets to the game, longer, the minimum higher, price, right? yeah, the minimum price is like around, um, around like sixteen hundred. You know, like, wow. 
Okay, so say if my wife and I wanted what to go to that. What could you do with $1,600, Carmen? Okay, or <laughs> how about, like about like $3,200? car payments. That's a, that's a mortgage payment. I don't know what it is. It's a lot of things. So $3,200, right? Uh, because, no, you know. you could just go by yourself. What uh, are you talking about? Yeah, my, my <laughs> wife wouldn't be too happy if I went by myself. So $3,200. She, <laughs> she is. <laughs> okay. And and so then parking, then oh god, food at the game, um, and all that other stuff. You can't and, do any and, of that. And those come are, on now, those you are frivolous. Well, if you're spending thirty two hundred dollars, you <laughs> got to They're nothing. <laughs> you might. I was going to say that. The, the, that's Drop in a bucket. That's all peanuts. Uh, right. So I was like, uh, no, no, I'm not. I would much yeah. rather sit at that's home. That's an easy decision. That's yeah. an easy decision. Yeah, Jeez. I've gotten to the I point. Mean, where... I, I'm all for people spending the money they make on whatever they want. I mean, honestly, it's it's your you oh, you don't yeah. get to take yeah. it when you're gone. You might as well right. do something with it now. And if if that would truly make you happy, you should totally do that. Oh yeah, yeah. But you should also think about it really hard. Yeah, well, it's not, yeah. What's interesting is I've I've kind of gotten to the point. You know, somebody was asking me, you know, what was the last uh, concert that you went to? And, and yes, I did go to a concert to the Lemonheads to take my oh, daughter no, to her cool. very first concert. And it was a small venue, um, standing room, but in just a really small like place. And so that to me, comfortable, fine. It was funny that most everybody, like my daughter was truly 100% the youngest person there. There was, you know, everybody was my age and probably older. And so... And so it was slow. It was relaxed. It was not you know, the crazy, like, you know, uh, I don't know, like uh, Metallica was at uh, Ford Field um, recently. And my son went there and he was like, oh, it was crazy. You know, the whole, like everybody was out on the field. There was mosh pits. There were all this other stuff. I'm like, there was a time in life that that sounded appealing. Not anymore. Right. Like, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> Sorry, a young man's game right there. Exactly. <laughs> and and so to be quite honest with you, I I enjoy watching sports on TV at the comfort of, in the comfort of my own home. I can choose and I can pick and choose what I'm like. Oh, look! Here's my you know uh, three dollar big bag of Tostitos or something. Instead of like the, yeah. the small <laughs> the cheap date, <laughs> yeah, like the little small bag of the same thing right. for 40 bucks, mm -hmm. but you could also get a collector's cup for $3,200. I would scrounge up 300 more dollars out of the, the couch upstairs because I'm sure it's in there, right? Yeah, uh, to buy the new Apple Vision Pro headset. I would rather have that than, than go to a football Can game. Can you just imagine for two people, um, watching the football game on the yeah, headset? from where from anywhere you want on the field? Oh, yeah, that I would think. be amazing. Well, so, so in, in its current state, you could you could stretch that out and have like a 120 inch screen, right? right. It would that's what it would feel like, and you right. could pin that in the room in front of you and you could look around at other stuff and the, and you'd look back and the screen would be there and, and it would be enormous you'd have right. great sound but you would you would be pretty isolated right but yeah. you'd probably want it like that you like you really want to enjoy the game and no one else around you dial the little the little knob and it darkens out the room and all you have is the big beautiful screen and uh you know it's like 4k 120 inches yeah. but there will be a day yeah. when because because the technology in the architecture, in the building, is going to be at a point where every single player's movements are going to be fully tracked, yeah. textured, yeah. represented in virtual space. Well, and you're going to be able to watch that game from anywhere you want in that stadium. And that is going to be an insane experience. And I hope it happens sooner than later because yeah. I would love my 80-year-old father-in-law who loves the San Francisco 49ers yeah. to experience a game like that. I think Where he he's would just literally standing right next yep. to Kyle Shanahan on the sidelines. You know, I don't know who the, I don't know that name, but but yes, that person. Okay, well the <laughs> your 80-year-old father-in-law knows that that's the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers. So he can tell the coach which plays to run. <laughs> exactly. and yeah, yeah, you should yeah, here's what yeah. you should be doing cuz I'm sure he he has those opinions. I I hear them when when I watch the games with him sometimes. But he, yeah. He th that would be so incredible, wouldn't it? Like yeah. to to just 
I think that when this this whole quote unquote new era of spatial computing, mm-hmm. it's it's going to be driven by entertainment, just like technology is for our field and visual effects, and you know it's it's video games and high end visual effects penetrate other markets, and and now it's going to get to consumers in a way that they haven't been able to experience before, because company like Apple who delivers real experiences for people is going to think about this differently than than the other VR companies that have been out there before. Not that they don't matter because sure. they do matter on how we got here. But sure. I think the the experiences people are going to be able to have, this is something that architects should be, really be paying close attention to uh, I, because this yeah. spatial awareness, spatial experiences that are digital are going to then work their way back into the physical world. People are so, going to be extremely interested in making their space as good as the virtual spaces that they experience because they're going to be disappointed when they take those headsets off and they're like, oh, this is my house and it's pretty boring. So so remember back to the conversation that we had years ago with the fellow from Shop Architect. And yeah, he, John Cerrone. Yeah, thank you. And he was talking about uh, how they were implementing real-time data in the construction um, mm-hmm. when things like a large, when he was talking about that, that, that ceiling and how the ceiling was basically measured and then the steel was put in and then re-measured mm-hmm. and then other things were fabricated off of and everything was laser scanned. Laser scanned and then they bring it back in and compare it to the BIM so, to make sure that it's actually right. matching up, that kind of thing. So yeah. so think about how that and LIDAR and like high def imagery and all of this other stuff can give us real time feedback. So to the point of when we're having, say, a virtual construction meeting and or somebody asks an RFI and mm-hmm. they're like, you know, well, I need to see, I really need to kind of understand like, what, what it is that you're asking about. You know, a lot of times it's like, give me more photographs or, you know, I'm going to have to need, do a site visit or things like that. And sometimes say you know, you're you know, doing things internationally or a different part of the country or whatever. And that's not always as easy to be able to get, you know, a real time return on Mm -hmm. the information that they're looking for. And I can see this playing a big role, not just in the design aspect of things, but also in the construction aspect of things Mm -hmm. to the point where. There was a few years ago when, when we were looking at a technology developed by an Israeli startup who were using the Microsoft HoloLens, which is an AR. Yeah. You know, it's like it was actually pretty well adopted in construction because you could overlay the virtual world on top of the digital world and see things like where HVAC ducts were going to be installed, for example. But what they had done was they were taking this to and and using its cameras to scan a room on site Mm -hmm. and they were piping that back to offices, our office, where our senior construction administration person had another set of goggles on. And the space that that the person on site was capturing was being sent back in near real time to the person who was going to answer the question. Right, right. right. And it was was like, look to your left, go down. And it was like, where does this embed need to go? There's a conflict with with something else. And And they could actually capture it in real time sketch virtually in real time on top of that and solve the problem right then. We, so, you know, we're going through a, um, on another project, we're going through this effort of doing some redesign for user groups now that we have user groups on. And a lot of the generic um, lab spaces were already built because with the delay caused by COVID and everything else and remote working mm-hmm. and stuff. It really, mm-hmm. it really did take a while to get the, um, the user groups uh, that would be occupying those spaces on, uh, on you know, like committed to the building. And so now that we're there and things have been built and now that we're really understanding some of their demands, what they need, 
uh, to, for their for their labs to like work seamlessly. You know, we're we're obviously running into conflicts because um, some of this is an existing building, some of it is there's new, new building. information. Now, there's right? a lot of new, <laughs> yeah. you know, a lot of new information, a lot of new requests for things to be yeah. done in spaces that may or may not really accommodate them, and to be able to see when you're looking up and say your model, or say you're the contractor and the engineer is talking about, okay, well, I need to run a new duct, a new, new exhaust duct. You know, where do we have it? We're getting information, so we're looking at the structure. We're looking at the in-place piping and you know, the in-place duct work and all of that other stuff, trying to find routes for this. And we spent a lot of time, we, we spent a lot of time going back and forth with the contractors trying to you know, work through all of this stuff. And sometimes I always wish, he's like, God, I wish that we could just really almost see a you know real time almost see an overlay of well clearly it's something that we could very well do it it is something that can be done right now actually and i i the the under construction part of it is is really being pioneered by robotics companies because those things are doing the work when nobody's at the building on the job so they'll send Boston Dynamics has the spot robot, the yellow four-legged, the quadruped autonomous robot that you can mount different, they call them payloads, on top of. So that'll, that, that could be a, a 360 camera. It could be a LiDAR scanning camera. There's even an arm. So it can actually open door with doorknobs and, and go through them. It can go up and down stairs because it's not like a tread-based or a track-based or a wheel-based robot. It, it actually has legs, right? So... It can go upstairs, it can go downstairs. And even, I think, back to the John Cerrone thing, right? It was like you you scan it at night when that day's work has been done, and then that point cloud gets processed and merged into your BIM data so you can actually see what was happening. Now, who gets to see that? I mean, you get to decide who gets to see that. The contractors right. are really interested in having that information because they can see how much progress was made for their scheduling that they're working on constantly making adjustments, right, with scheduling of trades and different people coming in or taking something out and redoing something. And so it's it's pretty interesting to watch that work being pioneered by robotics companies because it can walk the same path as often as you want, and it will rescan and, and just constantly be giving you a new version of the latest status update on actual construction of what's been put in place, what was on, compare that to the schedule, what should have been in place, who should be out here, when are they coming, this needs to happen before that. Right. Now, it's also useful for architects, right? Because architects can actually see if the building is being built within a tolerance that needs to be achieved for certain things to happen, like sure. facade skins and yeah. things like that where it's really like the the tolerances are going to be a lot more critical right so yeah. i think there's a lot of uses for things like this and and it is pretty interesting to see it like you can do it by hand but you can also send a robot out to do it and it can do it when nobody's working you know you're getting a level of accuracy probably um that you know oh it's it's it, crazy yeah. it's within a millimeter over 300 feet or something it's it's probably more accurate than that when when they're doing actual lidar scanning sure yeah. exactly which you know i mean do we construct to that level um we we would like <laughs> it to depends on the it, sophistication it, of the contract it, it, the materials. exactly it depends exactly. on a lot of things yeah right but yeah that uh some things need that accuracy. I mean, you've worked on lab buildings that require a certain level of yeah. accuracy and sound dampening and tolerances, yes. and, and they are very – those are critical things that need to happen. And that clients paying critical thing prices for that to happen, right, because yeah. it is, it is a, it's a lot more difficult to do. But the yeah. – I was updated on what the current projection of – the lab building that we're doing is going to cost. And when I heard it, my jaw dropped. I was like, I don't think that I ever worked on a project of this financial magnitude. Wow. It was um, 
pretty startling. I know. For... I said I said the budget of my last project that I really worked on, and you kind of laughed at it <laughs> like it was nothing, and it was my biggest project. <laughs> so, so what was your biggest project? Sixty-five million. Okay, half a billion. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, those are close numbers. Yeah. There. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, yeah. Exactly. You know. <laughs> You know, plus or minus, give or take, right? Yeah. I I mean... It's, remember, it's scary being in charge of that much, the decisions that go it, into spending it, that much money. And, I mean, it's, and so it's, they are looking for that millimeter tolerance. They are looking for um, a high level... They to be perfect. Exactly. Right? You know, yeah. there, is a, there is a definite um, expectation that is something that is in a league far beyond like say working on like a 12 billion dollar rec center edition or a or a school-based health center where we were doing like these little small editions or, or yeah. you know, for anything out of wood framing or whatever yeah, yeah. composition shingles. Or, or yeah, it's not the same exactly and so to to go through that and and, and i think about it, we We've talked about like the line in Saudi Arabia and working on a project in Saudi Arabia and the overall development size of these things. The the size of the development was one thing that just to me was staggering. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. um, I've like I've seen big scale public works projects before, but not to this not to this level. Yeah. And not to this level of, you know, to be quite honest with you, level of sophistication of like all of the infrastructure that's going in there. And then to just, and I don't even know it, and it probably will never really be published, but to just try to fathom how much that would cost. Mm-hmm. Um, one of these days we should do an episode where we just look at the infrastructure through the lens of Google Earth, because you can you can see it, hmm. you can see the network of of utility tunnels and vehicular tunnels, and you know all of the infrastructure for the public realm, and all the money that you're paying that will that you can't see. Oh right? my gosh, yes, yeah, like the project that I did that was sixty five million dollars. A lot of that money was buried in the ground. There was like a hundred and twenty. 70 foot deep piers that had to be poured and, and placed because the soil underneath was in such bad shape. And this was a science building. It needed to have pretty stiff structure. Uh, and I mean, not only that, but there was all kinds of signs of, of displacement throughout the campus of, of differential settlement over many decades. Right. Yeah. And it was like, this, that can't happen to this building. Right. right. <laughs> and, and, and it's a shame, right? Because you're, you, you never see that. I mean, it's not a shame because you, 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 it's an investment into the building. But at the same time, it's like you can't spend all the money that's in the ground on the building anymore because you, it's, you just can't see it. You know, that's another episode that we can talk about things because when we have projects that go over budget and then we're asked to do an exercise of value engineering, and I know oxymoron there, get it, but when the bulk of the money of like the actual honest to goodness like cost savings are things that you can't see and so then then it it bears down on the architecture's responsibility to oh you're 25 million dollars over you know hey let's start cutting this or that i remember a, and the reason I threw out twenty five billion is because, um, because a budget was cut for a systemic high school renovation and exterior facade upgrade. Um, they came back and they said, "Oh well, we've you know lost some funding. You know, we're twenty five million dollars over. We need to start cutting things." And. As, you actually have to just start losing enormous pieces of the building. Well, that was, that, that was, see, so that program. was what I was, you know, so I had suggested. But they don't want to do that. And they did not want yeah. to do that. So I suggest <laughs> those things and they're like, no, 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 we need that program. 
And so they're like, you know, that. we people are depending on that. We the people you can't break everyone's heart who's wanted that yeah. for the last twenty years, kind of a thing. Yeah. So what? Yeah. So let's just build it out of popsicle sticks. Exactly. What's the answer? And and so <laughs> to to realize that you would have to go through it's it's hatchet jobs when you're talking about yeah. you know millions right. you know tens of millions of dollars clear cutting it's not, it, yeah we're doing clear instead of doing it's, hatchet jobs instead of cutting kindling you need to do clear cutting yeah it, it is not scalpel <laughs> it is you know it it is as you say slash and burn it's it's you know find the big ticket right. items and it's so so interesting because this is when I started to like ease up on other architects and what the final product was because yeah, you know you, once you've been through it because yeah, once you, you've been yep. through it once you there's so many things oh out of your gosh. control like that yeah that's uh yeah and and you don't know that story because you don't know that story and exactly it's like you we can need... look at it and on the surface you're going to judge it based on the ideal situation it's like wow this is really not ideal it's like well you should have seen what we had yeah. to go through. Yeah. <laughs> that story is not told. I was walking around a building with another architect uh, in San Francisco during the AIA convention. You were, you were at. I was your, stuck in a booth. Yeah, you were stuck in your booth, and so we were walking around and we were touring it. And the first inclination for us was to say, "Oh, well, I would have done this," or "Oh, I would have done that," and I <laughs> and I. I rebuttaled. You were spending someone else's money. Yeah. I, I rebuttaled with, they probably <laughs> did. And yeah. I was just like, oh, this canopy could have been so much better if they did that. I'm like, yes, but it would also would have been so much more expensive. And what is the first thing to go is it's, it's architecture. It's, it's the low-hanging fruit that you think that you can save so much money on. And when you go through and you're like, oh, well, you know, we still need a canopy. But now it's going to be this. And so it's like you're taking, you know, like small percentages off of like the real money. It's not, as you said, it's not this clear cutting. It's not like the big hatchet job of like, you've got to cut program. You know, you want to save $25 million. There's, you know, 25,000 square feet of additional, like, you know, that addition that you wanted. There you go. A later phase. Yeah. yeah. Later phase. Exactly. Nobody wants to hear that, though. I mean, and what's crazy is like your contract obligates you as the architect to re refine the design yeah. to to get it within budget. Yeah. And you do that work for free because there's no more fee. Right. Right. And usually it comes so late in the process, there actually is no more fee. <laughs> <laughs> and really, at the end of the day, I've found so many times the cost savings effort ends up costing the same amount or potentially more. Oh, dude, I can't even, I, I didn't even really want to go there but since <laughs> you said it. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been through a VE session only to hear from the estimator who works for the contractor say, we're still the exact same number over. Yeah. How many and how many like, times have you, you know, gone through that going. effort where they're like, Yeah, but that was yesterday's price. You know, right. we had that locked in. <laughs> you Or we found more stuff in the building that we didn't know was there. Well, it's like, what are you talking about? It's been there the whole time. You've had the plans the whole time. Every time there's a new set of plans, you have the set of plans. It's it's yeah. ridiculous. Well one of the one of the interesting things about because we were Per the you know, 500 million number, we started talking about what the original number was. And then we talked about what some of the causes for the escalation were. And then we talked about, you know, other you know, scope creep items or, or ads or building things out and then basically tearing them out and rebuilding them with different user groups and things like that. And one of the things that they never seem to take into account it, but yet every single solitary person knows that this occurred was COVID. This was, this was supposed to actually go, you know, start construction just around, well, so actually it had already started construction before COVID. Remember how much a sheet of OSB was? Oh my gosh. COVID? It was like $80. Yeah. I might even be underestimating yeah. there. It was 
there was there was some meme going around where there was like this barn find of, well, a, of an old 911 with a sheet of OSB on it, and it was like I I know what I've got. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was regarding the sheet of OSB, exactly, not the Porsche, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I know that we've diverged from what we were originally talking about, but you know these are the things that it's interesting how we don't think about like all of the other things like. So let's bring it back to you know, this this uh, conversation that we were having earlier about uh, affording um, this, affordances. The yeah. yeah, is that these are all of the things that sort of affect the way that we do what we do and why we do it, and sometimes that's some of like the the cause and effect of why we do you know, the four a.m. to ten p.m. kind of like you know work shifts is like we we feel like we need to play the hero and it's like, all right, we're $25 million over. I'll find it. You know, kind of thing. And you're like, no matter what it takes. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, no matter what sacrifice, I'll find it. And then you go through all of these things and, you know, you, like you said, we do t typically a lot of this stuff is unpaid value engineering because we're you know, going through to try to find and help reduce the costs and stuff. And so, but we're sacrificing. because yeah, you have to. Exactly. So, you know, we sacrifice all of this time coming up with all of this stuff. I remember, you know, presenting, I don't know, it was like 50 pages of of different, you know, like all sorts of different options. It was, it was this menu of all of these different things. And at the end of the day, they weren't interested in doing like the main, you know, cost-saving efforts. They wanted to like cherry pick, oh, okay, well then, you know, you're saying that we can go from this window system to this window system and he's like, well, yeah, but that's only going to save you 50,000. You know, like, it's not going to save you. It's like, if you don't have like that plus the walls, plus the floors, plus the this, plus the that, that's where your big savings is going to be. Your mechanical cost, you know, things like that. Or when they say, yeah. you know, oh, hey, we want to change the windows from you know, these high performance uh, windows to a lesser performance because we can get, you know, we can save 20% on the overall purchase of all of this storefront. And you're like, okay, yes, but, you know, your life cycle cost of operating the building is going to be that much more. You're going to, if you're not going to change the system to have a more efficient system for these lower performing windows, guess what? Now you're going to yeah. be, you will be replacing that equipment later on down the road. And so where is your savings? Yeah. You know, and it's and just paying like, more money for energy to get there too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, yeah, I guess the, I the thing that we're really saying here, Cormac, is, you know, we imparted a little bit of wisdom earlier with the, the quote from, from my guest on the, yeah. it's not about architecture. It's about the life afforded, but we'll also impart a little bit more wisdom, which is that every building is actually a spreadsheet. Yeah. I was going to, they don't teach that in school. I was going to say that to your original quote is like, um, say that one more time though. So, it's not about architecture. It's about the life afforded. Yes. It's not about architecture. It's about the life that is stolen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs>